Good morning. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Looks like everybody came in here in the last five minutes. Certainly appreciate everyone being here for integrating NEPA and permitting. I'm Mike Ruth with the Office of Project Development Environmental Review from Federal Highways Headquarters in Washington. And I'll be co-presenting with? I am Dave Williams. Of the same office. Who here with their states thinks or knows they have a merger agreement? Colorado, I know California. I actually did a survey about four years ago where I called the divisions. And it looks like we have good represent, representation. I know California has one, which they're using. It looks a little dated, but it's still working. Um, Hawaii apparently does have one, but not exactly using. Is that correct? Are you aware? Yeah, I contacted the division office, actually dug it out. So glad you're here. We may be able to get that back back online for you. New Mexico um, apparently has an agreement of some sort. These are just sort of a four or four merger agreements. Um, Colorado definitely has one. I think theirs is uh, pretty recent. Is that right, David? Right. Um, Utah does not have one. Are they represented here? Anybody from Utah? No, okay. Um, Nebraska does have one. I also heard through the grapevine that they're interested in updating that. And Arizona, anybody here from Arizona? Do you guys have a merger agreement of some sort? No, I had a question mark on that. So here's our agenda. Basically going to walk you through what we're trying to sell here. Um, hopefully you guys will buy. Um, it's pretty, uh, it's an innovation that's actually been out there a while, but it's it could be used perhaps to more, you know, to build some more capacity into it. And um, for those who do not have one, certainly is taking a worth look if you want to make the best um, pathway to project, delivering projects. One thing I will say um, with integrating NEPA and permitting, you can't get through to any of these innovations here that we're offering 11 innovations until you get through NEPA. Okay, you don't get through NEPA, you don't get to construction, you don't get to use all these, you know, community connections, all these pavement techniques. So pretty important that we get through NEPA, you know, as efficiently, as effectively as we can, um, because we get through that, we can take advantage of all these other great things we have out there. Um, Dave's gonna present a case study from the Tappan Zee Bridge, um, which is quite an incredible project, three point something billion dollars. 18 permits, um, ride to FEIS in 11 months. Um, a lot of history, so it's a good story. It's a good example to use. It's you know, the top shelf um, example we have out there. And then you know, what we have to offer for you if you guys do decide to sign on for this innovation. So I, my guess here, most of us are familiar with integrating NEPA and permitting since there's a lot of mergers out there. Basically, it's a good way to coordinate with your other federal agencies who you need permits from, who are cooperating agencies, who you, you need to engage to get through, get through that challenge. Um, historically, EISs could have taken you know, seven to 10 years. Now we're trying to get that down to four years. So Congress is looking at us really hard to see we meet that timeline. We got the presidential dashboard out there where everybody, it's outward facing, so um, the public's watching how quickly we're accelerating these projects. And the legislative landscape couldn't be better. Um, I know we got a new uh, administration coming in. It sounds like he's all gung-ho to get the infrastructure going. Hopefully that'll come to fruition here and uh, we'll see perhaps this program really pick up. Um, there's a co couple of presidential directives I have up here, which is not just for federal highways or the DOTs, it's for all of us, it's for Fish and Wildlife, it's for the Army Corps, all federal agencies are responsible for making sure we're accelerating projects as efficiently and as effectively as we can, which includes getting to a permit decision in the best way possible. I know you can't read this slide, but what I'm trying to capture here um, is you got the number of laws and EOs over here with the date, starting with the River and Harbors Act of 1899 up here until the FAST Act. What, there's 70-some? 
how do we get through all these EOs, these, these acts, Clean Water Act, Mi Migratory Bird Treaty Act? Um, it's just loaded, and how do, how do we get through that? So how do we manage, manage this? And one of the best ways we can manage that is through an integration process. So you can look at this and say, how do we, do pro how do we even get to a permit decision on a project? How do we even get to this point? It's mind-boggling if we were to sit down and look at every one of these um, regulations, EOs, laws, we have to at least consider how do we get to that point. So a good way to manage it, again, is through integration. So again, what is integration? We're trying to synchronize what we do. We're, not tr we're getting away from our stovepipe. We have all these agencies that have their missions. Everybody's in their little box. Fish and Wildlife with Species, Army Corps with Wetlands, we have EPA with Water Quality, we have Coast Guard with Bridges, we have um, the uh, SHPO with Historic Resources, so how do we manage all that and, and put all that together? Um, it also calls for early identification and coordinating with the permitting agencies. Who do we invite to the table? So we have to get to our, invite these folks to our, you know, planning sessions to see what do we need to move forward? How, what, what information do they need from us as well? Okay, this is a handout. This actually came right from the Red Book, this one. It's a good example of what an integration process is. The columns are actually the agencies, the DOTs, Coast Guard, Fish, Army Corps, and their responsibilities. And then on the, the rows are the milestones, um, plan and schedule, purpose and need, range of alternatives. Everybody needs to be fitting these pieces together, coordinating with this. For example, Army Corps has a purpose and need. We have a purpose and need. We need to make those two mesh. I know we all have challenges here with agencies at time where we don't exactly agree on purpose and need. Here's a good opportunity where we can sit down the planning process and define purpose and need which fits, which fits each agency's you know, objectives and missions. And then again, this is for an EIS. We also have the exact same thing in a red book for an EA. And it's something you should keep um, close to. This is the best way you can explain integration process to your management. The approach is also scalable. When I say scalable, the buy-in is as much as you want it to be. It can be applicable to a CE, categorical exclusion, to an EA, and to an EIS. <clears throat> People say, oh, really, a CE? Yes, sure, because we have CEs with documentation. We have CEs that impacts resources, um, could impact a historic resource, aquatic resource, a species. We may need to go through some sort of an integration process with them. <clears throat> it's also good in case we have an emergency. If you have an integration process in place, you know who the players are, you know who to contact. We have a bridge that fails. Who do we call? Coast Guard, Army Corps? Are there species that may be concerned if we're doing a repair? So no, having all those players, um, a collaboration in place, who to, know, who to call to pick the phone up. If you have an integration process in place, you'll know who to do that with. So why should you invest? You should invest because we have, we have challenges out there. We haven't always engaged our resource agencies in a timely fashion. I can give some examples. Um, Coast Guard comes to mind with bridge permitting. I've seen actually here in California, this is at the MPO level, where Coast Guard was called late to the game in a couple instances for a bridge permitting. Um, things eventually did work out. It would have been a lot smoother um, if they were engaged early on. Coast Guard gets left out of a lot of um, collaborations because people don't really understand what a navigable water is, what the responsibilities are. The waterway may not seem navigable to you, but it could be navigable, in fact, to the Coast Guard. If it's tidal, it's, it's jurisdiction by definition, so they should be engaged. Um, also, um, we have other natural resources as in species, as in our Army Corps, to make sure we go through our pre-permitting decisions, get pre-permitting information that all agencies we need, because some agencies can actually adopt our environmental documents. Coast Guard can, 
Army Corps can adopt pieces of it, and certainly Fish and Wildlife Service and other agencies are going to need project descriptions from that. We have instances where we are advancing projects before they're ready, could be because of funding. We're in such a rush to get a project through NEPA, we sometimes don't have the funding to do that. We're good point to maybe keep that down in the planning stage before we advance that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if time passes on, we're going to come back and have to revisit or reinvent the wheel again. So it's good to know if you have a project that can actually be funded and actually be permittable because we can't get to a ride unless we have that. And Dave's going to present this um, with his presentation is contracting methods. Are we familiar with um, bid build design? Design, sorry, design, design bid build. Um, it's a sort of a new technique, but uh, an issue with it with the um, resource agencies is they don't have that window or they don't have that finite impact that defined so they can say what the adverse impacts are due to the projects. But with a design bid build, we were is able to give them. Mike, it's the reverse. <laughs> Does, the Edit, old way please. was design bid build, where, where you did your design, you know, and then you go out for bid and then you actually there you construct. Go. Whereas design I'm build. I'm a geologist. <laughs> so we don't always have the resource agencies. The point being is resource agencies don't have the information they need to make a permit decision. For example, Army Corps needs to know, well, how many acres of wetlands are you going to impact? How many linear feet of stream are you going to impact? Well, with, a, with that contracting method, <laughs> you'll be able to give them a window. We know it's going to be this much. We know it's not going to exceed this. So we can proceed forward within that, that window we provide them. And uh, they will provide an example of how, how we can do that through workshops because if we can educate the resource agencies about our needs and what to expect, they'll be able to um, process a permit in that way. So how can we better, better integrate? Um, said this before, through coordination plans and schedules, invite the agencies to the table early. It's, it's key. Army Corps actually has it written, pre-application meeting into their, their process there. Um, we also encourage to have meetings quarterly with your resource agencies just so they know what's coming up, you know, what's complex projects, what are the information needs, what are the resource needs, especially with people. Merger agreements. A lot of states here already have merger, merger agreements, but are you really utilizing them to the fullest extent? If they're dated, go back and take a look at them because some of our um, EOs have changed, some of our laws have shifted. Yes, sure can. <clears throat> a merger agreement is an agreement between, let's say, a resource agency and the state DOT. So let's say Caltrans and the Army Corps of Engineers. They agreed on how to proceed through a project on a path. They'll address purpose and need, perhaps screening criteria, um, alternatives analysis, and they'll walk the project along with them constantly exchanging information. So everybody's on board. They ha it's actually a written agreement that everybody signs. And it's a process that everybody has agreed to follow. So and it can be as flexible as, or as restrictive as you guys feel like, well, we can't go back and talk about purpose and need once we get past that. You know, it's however you want to design these things. Is that? It can be, you can, the Tappan Zee example is actually project um, specific, which they're actually going to take to a program right, wide, but most of these are program. Uh, okay, regular, I can't speak this enough. I was a former Army Corps um, regulator in Savannah District, and I can't stress how valuable these were. I was the li liaison with um, Georgia Department of Transportation, and these meetings would have quarterly. Um, we're instrumental in getting projects you know, through the permitting process. We would make, you know, site visits. We go look at, look at these sites. We look at different alternatives. And uh, it's a good way to know who the players are. Um, I know phone calls and webinars are great, but having a face-to-face -face meeting, hands down, is the best way to collaborate, if you can. I know some of these states are out west are pretty big, and maybe that's a little challenging, but 
if, if you have that opportunity, certainly take advantage of it. All right, um, liaisons. Catherine Liller here is a, our national liaison for, with Fish and Wildlife Service. I work with her weekly on you know, programmatics or on projects of national significance or if we have a challenge with a uh, certain DOT, she's who I go through and she can reach down through her folks. We also have these at the state level. Are people here familiar with the state level program? I would like to think a lot of the West, Western states do have a liaison of one sort. You can actually use federal dollars to fund a liaison position with another federal agency. You can also use state dollars too. There's some state funded liaisons out there. We have these with Fish and Wildlife um, Service, Army Corps. Um, we have a national one with Advisory Council, like for SHPO, um, EPA, uh, Coast Guard, we have a national liaison. So these are the best way. Um, if you have a local liaison at the state level, you can actually set their priorities. You would do this through an MOA or some other sort of agreement. You have performance standards, expectations, what they're going to work on. They can't sign the work off, it has to be one level up, but you'll be rest assured, you'll get your work in the door, you're not going to be put behind like everybody else. So that's probably the best way to accelerate your projects is to find one of these positions. We also have some web-based tools, eNEPA is another one which is now expanding. You want to speak a little bit on that, David? Yeah, eNEPA is a, is a um, way of processing your EAs and EISs, uh, j doing joint coordination. Um, it's an electronic tool that we've developed and uh, are right now actually modifying as a result of the input we've gotten. But it allows you to set up uh, your, your outline for your EIS or your EA, have people comment and store their comments within the same system. And then depending on what you like to do or what type of comments you like to share, it allows you to share that with your other team members. Um, and then, yeah, it's a, it's a document, a good document review. Uh, <coughs> Process. We also have a red book. Are we familiar with the red book here? It, there was a 1988 red book between us and several other agencies um, for merging um, 404 permitting and federal highway type projects. That has been rewritten in 2010. Catherine's one of the authors of it. I helped author it. It's available online. If you need a hot, hard copy, I can get you one. But this is the how-to guide to synchronize or integrate projects. Chapter one actually takes you through it. We also describe um, how the liaison program works. We have templates in there. Um, I think the Colorado um, merger agreement is, is actually referenced in there, a few others. So there's examples in there you can pull from. It's one of the best resources if you're considering improving what you have or you know developing something from new. And it's something for, it has something for everyone. I keep preaching this, something for everyone. You can do as low budgets as you want or you can go all out. Um, the expense really isn't that great to get these integration um, procedures in place if you decide to go that route. Also, we have available online is Ecological, which is this pamphlet here, Implementing Ecological, which is sorting to morph into something of its own um, can you speak to there's a starter kit or? Yeah, we have an online um, website which we refer to the starter kit. It has a series of case studies, uh, one of which we've done on, on CDOT Colorado. Dave Singer helped us out. And then um, it also provides additional resources um, such as explains each of the nine steps of the ecological process. How do you bring people together to collaborate? How do you develop a regional ecosystem framework and utilize that GIS technology to, to contain that information? And how do we set priorities within that, that framework, that, um, that regional framework? So it provides a lot of uh, information, step-by-step -step approach. It's also integrated, or we're starting to integrate it with our plan works tool, which uh, brings in the planning process. How can we get people involved in the planning process um, start to integrate some of that documentation and bring that into the NEPA process. We're also starting to integrate, and I'm, I'm going to stop here. I tend to be No, it's way. fine, David. <laughs> We're also starting to look at programmatic mitigation um, planning. 
You know, as you know, the FAST Act allows for programmatic mitigation planning to be funded by planning dollars. Um, so we're coming out with uh, updating the ecological uh, starter kit to include that information. How do we do this? How, when is it appropriate to do this? So. Thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to you with the Tappan Z example. Okay, so over time we saw we were focused primarily on single resources, doing things sequentially. Uh, then we kind of got this push saying we need to do things quicker, faster, better, at lower costs. Uh, so what we want to do is kind of show you an example, Tappan Z Bridge, that did that. It's kind of the Cadillac version. So here you have a bridge that was built in 1955. How, many, how old is it? Six, Six, 67, I don't know, yeah, it's o over 50 years old. It can be considered a resource. Okay, so it's, it's over 50 years old. It's the only crossing for 51 miles. So if you're trying to get in and out of that New York area, this is the only way to do it for 51 miles. It's a 3.1 mile long bridge um, and it's twin span. So it's the major um, commute route. So that's kind of what we're, we're faced with. Um, over time, we saw a 30% increase in traffic. And also, since it's so, 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 uh, so old, we also see that it's starting to, it doesn't quite meet new design standards. So we have a bridge, sole source for 50 miles of getting across major throughway. Uh, capacity has kind of been reached and we're also looking at design standards. So we have safety and capacity uh, issues. You want to advance to the next slide? So we had to look at how do we do innovative contracting? We got a quick time frame. We got significant environmental impacts and communication. So these are the things that we started looking at or, um, in terms of advancing this project. We can't do the traditional design build. It takes too long. I mean design bid build, sorry. It takes too long. So let's start thinking about design uh, design build. Design bid build, we usually get to 30% design, we have NEPA completed, and with that, and if you're doing an EIS, you're, you're talking about seven years, right? We were given the, the responsibility of getting this done in three to five years. Constructed in three to five years, including NEPA process, right? So, yeah, we can't go through that design bid, bid build. Um, the significant environmental impacts, we have two endangered species here. We have sturgeon, two types of sturgeon, and uh, Atlantic, Atlantic sturgeon, right? Atlantic and short nose. And short nose sturgeon. So we've, we're going to have to do... Which one, Catherine? I don't know. That's new. Yeah, I think it's, it's two, two species of sturgeon. <laughs> so we have some serious consultation that we're going to have to do. And then communication. To make this work, we're going to have to get people on board early, quickly. Um, and we're going to have to have some pretty solid decision making. So what we've done is design build, we've got a quick time frame, we've got significant impacts, we've got to bring these folks together, we've got to be able to get folks to decide, well, on our team that can make decisions right then and there as we need them. We want to be able to pick up the phone and say, hey, here's the issue, what do we do? Or here's the issue, here's our recommendation, and we need you to be able to make a decision. Next slide. Yeah, there. Okay. So, again, like I talked about, you know, we, we did the uh, notice of intent to record a decision in 11 months. Uh, we had to secure 18, well, secure all permits within 18 months. And, that, and that's kind of, the next slide. Yeah. Let me give a little more history um, on the Tappan Z. The project's actually been around for a little while, so there was a lot of science behind it. There was a lot of um, impacts on, on fish, hydroacoustic studies done, done on the waterway. There had to be a lot of sediment testing. A lot of, a lot of these pieces were, were front-loaded, and that's what we're, we're, we're you know, preaching here, is front-loading your project before you get to the NOI. Because once you get to the NOI, that clock starts ticking, and then we have Congress looking at us, we want to make sure we're getting these things permitted within, or you know, decisions and within four years to the EIS. And again, if you look at the, you know, necessary permits secured in 18, have those permits in 18 months, that's, there was quite a few permits to secure in that. And we know simply from doing a uh, simple individual permit at the Army Corps, that can certainly take longer than 18 months or consulting with a resource agency. So if we front load these projects, we're, we're certainly better off. So the 11 months is a 
Yeah. It would have went back several years because the project had, the project was, you know, went through a tiered EIS approach. They pulled it back. It actually was a 30 some mile long project to begin with. They scaled it back just to the bridge. So there's a lot of, a lot of science that happened beforehand. But, but even with that, because you would have to do those studies before, you, sh you shouldn't really go to an NOI till you have done your studies. So you know what you got. You know what you're dealing with. So, but the key is once you get to the NOI, that clock starts. So we had to bring everybody in early. We had to set up our, our cooperative agreements. How are we going to work together? How are we going to get decisions made in a timely fashion? And we need the commitment from each of the agencies that are on our team. Um, and then who's going to be our point of contact, like I, like I talked about? We had to square that up. That's probably one of the most important pieces here, because we don't want to call someone and they have to, hey, let me check with my supervisor, or let me check with our headquarters office. That takes time. So we need to make sure that the folks that were in, on the team were empowered <coughs> to make the decisions we, we needed them to make. Um, and then, um, AG, we had, as you can imagine, with this type of project, we had tons of agency coordination meetings. And these are, took various forms, both in terms of in-person meetings, but also virtual meetings and conference calls. Again, we're, we're concerned about speed. We also, also have to be able to communicate with folks in a timely fashion. And face-to-face and -face meetings aren't always a timely way of doing that. So, And then we, we had a design build. Like I said, we uh, selected a design build process for, for a few reasons. One, it, it reduced our schedule, um, risks uh, and costs associated with design errors and omissions and transfer from owner to, to the design team. So there was a transfer and risk there. You also, uh, design build teams are also allowed to have some flexibility of innovation. Once you get out and you start looking at what you have, you may have to change things in the field. So this allowed them to do that. And it's a very good option for, for complex projects because you never know with all the players and, and with what you have out there, you never know what, what may, may creep up. So what we did through the team um, and, in, and involving our resource agencies early, they gave us the parameters by which we handed that off to the design build team. So here are the parameters that you're going to have to stay within. Um, and the resource agencies, are, you're good with that, right? Yeah, we're, we're good with that. So they kind of have an idea of what's coming, coming down the pike. Um, the other part of the design build piece was we had to get the, the resource agencies comfortable with what that process is all about. Usually they want things uh, tied down to the millimeter, if I can use that, or very tied down pretty to Pretty tight. A, pretty tight. But in that design build process, we want to have the flexibility to change things as, as they come up in the field. So we had to get them comfortable with the process. We had to sh talk about where, did, where should they be involved in the process and how is that constant communication going to occur within that design build process. The, the unique thing, and I'll, I'll come back to Catherine, Catherine. too, that we had here was the pre presidential dashboard. We had the presidential pressure. Yeah, the president says you got to get this. Yes. You got to get this out the door. We want it, you know, transparent. The public's going to look at your permit times. It's going to be it's going to be public facing, like Mike talked about earlier. I'm sorry. Overall, like everyone agrees to the decision or a specific? A specific agency. I mean, obviously, you know, no disrespect to our agency partners, but I mean, everyone has a boss. And so you don't always get the person that can make the final decision on a thing involved in the projects, even though you have fairly significant. Uh, another vehicle besides the liaison is some clear direction from maybe a cabinet saying this is the project. So resources from other sister agencies are dedicated towards priority project A, B, or C. And so they know that they mm -hmm. can set aside other clearance requests or permit requests. You can also set that expectation up front. Yeah. So people know that, hey, if you're going to participate, you're a decision maker. You don't feel comfortable with that. Or in some yeah, the, the one thing with the, if you do have a liaison, that would have to come one level above. but that one level above should be easily accessible if everybody knows what's, what's at stake and what's expected. Did you have a project that you did that on? You applied that to? 
we're, we're going to start up the significant EIS uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and we've, we've already discussed uh, a lot of these issues and um, you know we're, we've got our, our game plan in place. I mean, our notice of intent is going to go out probably in the next six, eight weeks. And a lot of these things that you've brought up, we've, we've already lined out. Right. And, and a lot of our partners uh, we deal with on a regular basis, and they're comfortable with dealing with us. And, but one thing I would suggest is if you're going to uh, go through the design build project process, they need to understand what that is. Because Where the workshop comes, uh, the workshop. Right. They're very familiar with the design bid build, but when you mention design build, right. their eyes get this big, and then we tell them, well, you aren't going to get plans, and their eyes get bigger, <laughs> but then you say, hold on, this is how we're going to handle that. And so you, you, you come up with a very conservative parameters, right. such as the, you know, we anticipate 30 yards of fill in this channel, but we'll, we'll permit it for 50 yards. So, so they, they, get, they get comfortable with that. Yes. Um, going to bullet number one, cooperating mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was specifically done since this project was a three billion dollar project, Tap and Z. The division, Federal Highway Newark Division Office, wanted to put a, co a cooperating agency agreement and have the agencies sign on to that. I think all the agencies signed on to it, but one which agency didn't sign on? Yeah. Fish and Wildlife. <laughs> But everybody outside on, it, we got through it, but it set the expectations, it set a project schedule, um, it just, it put it out there that we're all in this together, because if one fails, we all fail. So that was the, the heart and soul of that agreement. There's um, one, one agreement with all the agencies, and it's project specific. Yes, this was. and. Um, Melissa Tony, who was instrumental with the New York Division, who put this together, can share that document, and we, we can make that, that document publicly available if you would like to look at it. Who was going to do what, what their roles were, and what, who was the main contact, and when were they going to meet? I think it identified, because like I saw it, we just didn't sign it. And, um, so it identified, you know, what the role was of that agency, what their participation was, what their expectations. They had time frames. It was like when we're going to sign off on things, and to defend the service, we we didn't have trust resources that we thought were going to be significantly affected. So like, we don't want to be a cooperating agency. <laughs> Going back to point three, which I think is still the. The, the most important right one. empowerment and it's relation to the liaison agreements whether you do it in 11 months or four years or seven years how do you maintain that consistency with that personnel our biggest issue is we'll set up the, the point of contact they're empowered to make the decision let's assume yeah but they then move from Colorado to Georgia how do you maintain that continuity with the project? Because a lot of times, let's face it, someone's right on board, we're moving, moving along great, they take a job somewhere else, someone new comes in, and in theory, it should be a smooth transition. Seamless. Yeah, but rarely, it, it seems, is that the Yeah, um, it comes to relationship building, not only, I guess, on the person to person, but agency to agency. And yeah, there may be a, a little lag time where you'll have to re-educate someone if that happens, because we all move around. Has anyone faced that, that problem? I, I've, I've heard it. Well, we had so-and-so here, and then somebody else came, and now the ball games, the, the games changed. So I've, I've heard that before. So I'll use a, you know, federal highways. Um, I used to work for Washington State DOT. I worked for the division office in the resource center. And one of the things we've, that was, that's important to us is our, point, our internal points of contact. How do we maintain that same level of knowledge? Because you guys are asking us, hey, what's your opinion of this? Can we do this? What's the policy? So we've established a redundancy. So we have two points of contact for each state. So that when I'm talking with you, my partner, Deirdre, is getting CC'd on all the emails. She's on the calls with me. So as I'm on the on the uh, road for two weeks doing summits, <laughs> going up to Alaska to do, deal with uh, NEPA reassignment, 
she's got it in hand, and I'm still getting emails being kept up to loop. So part of it is developing a succession plan of sorts, a backup, building some redundancies, and setting priorities. So for our top priority projects, here's, what we, here's an option that we can, we can engage in. Any more on this? The, the point being here that, I mean, the, the, one of the biggest thing here was just having the coordination, having the relationship. It's, it's relationship building. Integration is as much as integrating NEPA as it is building relationships and collaboration. These merger agreements, they, some of the ones I've seen, they actually have um, decision points. And so, and they actually have all the agencies sign that this decision was made. And so then as they move forward, if that person were to change, it seems like that would probably <coughs> reduce some conflict because our, it, that, by that signature, that agency has signed off on that decision, even though you're not through the whole project. So <coughs> some of the uh, agreements that are put together, they, it's optional whether or not you want to have that, but some of them I've seen have, have that signature where all the agencies sign off on a decision point. Any more questions on the Tappan Z example? All right, so um, why should you do this? And, you know, why are we pushing this? Um, everybody likes having some predictability, all right? Integration is one way to, you know, approach that. Be having a project that's, you know, you have a process that's consistent and you have a high level of confidence and, you know, how that it's going to play out. So that's one important piece of this is having a, a, a measure of predictability there. We know we're going to go through an integration process. We know what to expect. We know what information needs to be shared. We know which agencies to invite to the table. Also, it sets the, it sets a good, the stage for early coordination. I've said this a lot, front-loading your project. Um, we have a MOA with the Coast Guard, which I've done some training um, with uh, Zachary Shulman from our uh, headquarters office with the Coast Guard. He and I have gone state to state to state. I know we've been out here in California and um, talking about this MOA. This MOA is an integration process in and of, of itself. So that's a good example of what integration process here. And that's a good example of how projects should be front-loaded. Because the first thing they, they, the Coast Guard will tell you is before you get to your, you know you have a bridge project, come to us. We're going to tell you which, what navigation interest you need to address so they can give you a navigational window which you can design your bridge around. Because if you don't have that window, you don't know how high your bridge has to be, you don't know where the navigational channel is, you don't know who your users are, that's going to affect your bridge design. So that's just one example. Um, an integration process in and of itself, which you can also utilize as we move forward towards implementing integration. Uh, the other thing too, though, you can't just look at it as project development being isolated in the design slash NEPA phase. You also have to look in planning. So you look across in the future at your program and you say, hey, wait a minute, we have Atlantic Salmon on 50 of our projects that are coming up in the next 10 years which an estimated cost of X by per project. So can we engage the resource agencies so that we can develop a programmatic approach to dealing with these projects as they come out, right? So that's, you, so you, you have to take, when, it, when, we're when we're talking about early and continual engagement, it's not just limited to the, to the NEPA process, but it's also looking at planning. Can we engage them in planning, look upstream and seeing what we're gonna be faced with, how can we get them engaged, who do we need to get engaged, and develop programmatic approaches as well. And, and this is your, I'm showing my ecological background as Dave, Dave knows. Um, but anyway, I'll throw it back over to you, Mike. Also, this slide speaks to mitigation. Um, many times we move a project forward and the last thing we want to talk about, and the last thing I used to hear when I was a regulator with the Army Corps was mitigation. I would ask, well, have you, this project looks great, looks like it's permittable. Have you thought about mitigation? And more times than not, mitigation was one of the last things to consider. Everybody's so focused on 
getting their project, you know, through NEPA, getting their project to the permit phase. Um, you can get a conditional permit with a conceptual mitigation plan, but that's not going to get you the permit you need to build. So you need to consider your mitigation opportunities, and that's where ecological can help you. That's where pro programmatic mitigation planning can help you. Um, so that's something that should be front-loaded as well. Where am I going to get my mitigation? If you're, if you're mitigation bank rich and lieu fee rich, you don't have a problem. That's third party, walk away. But if you're permitty responsible, meaning you have to do your own mitigation, you have to go find it, you have to secure it, and then you have to make sure that mitigation that you just mortgage is protected in perpetuity. So these could be some deal killers from project, and they can also consume a lot of your project budget. <laughs> we all know this. This is, you know, if you have a coordinated process, you're going to have better environmental incomes. Speaking towards mitigation, you know where your mitigation is going to be. Um, you're going to be able to exercise that to the best interest, interest of the project and to the environment. And everybody's going to come out ahead with that, and the resource agencies will, you know, look at that as a favorable. Also build some trust in there. If we have a good mitigation program with better environmental outcomes, that's trust building. Well, one, one project <laughs> that Mike and I, I worked on uh, was, was it North Carolina or South Carolina? South Carolina DOT. South Carolina DOT. So South Carolina DOT was looking out into the future, looking at what their mitigation needs were. And they said, hey, Federal Highways, we need, we need some help. So what we did was... This was a state that had no mitigation banking opportunities, no in lieu fee, everything was permitting responsible, and it was bec they have about 400 projects coming in line, it's becoming a big, he big headache for them. So. so what they did, they said, Federal Highways, we need help. Um, we brought in, we got the state regulatory agencies, the federal leg regulatory federal agencies. agencies, and then... We brought two uh, peers. We brought... Um, Maryland State Highway Administration with their water resources registry, their, their mitigation program. We also brought North Carolina DOT down, who has a unique in Luffy program where the DOT actually pays money to a sister state agency. That state agency then goes out and finds mitigation. And they have an instrument actually written with the Corps of Engineers to resolve that. So we brought those two parties together to explain um, that process, that methodology, South Carolina, in turn, DOT took that and came up with a short-range immediate plan and a long-range plan. And from what I hear lately, the short-range plan's in place, a long-range plan is being written. Right. So that's one example. Is that all we needed to say on that? Okay. Again, time and resources. We all know if the less time we spend running backwards and duplicating things, the better we are going to be with time and resources. Integration is a good way to do that. I know a lot of us have agreements in here, but step back, take a look, see if they need to be updated. Um, maybe things to meet, need to be tweaked. Maybe we need to bring other agencies in there, because a lot of these things are written strictly with the Army Corps and the DOT or the, Cal or the Transportation Agency of the state. All right, so some of the things we're going to offer, if you decide, if you go back to caucus, yeah, Mike and Dave did a great job presenting. We think we're going to give them a shot. I mean, it's low, low cost to get involved. This is probably one of the easiest things to do is, since a lot of you have mergers or agreements in place, go back and take a look at them. If you don't, take a look at some examples and maybe build upon those. So we're going to be offering technical assistance in the form of peer exchanges and workshops um, to help facilitate those, those talks. Um, we also have a library we're putting together. We have examples out there we can share. Again, the two, 2015 Red Book is a how-to guide. If nothing, request a copy of that. That will you know, give you the information you need as a reference. ENIPA, the revision of ENIPA is coming out in January. Again, that's a tool where you can upload your, your, your documents that you're using to um, develop your EAs, your EISs, get those comments in. It's a central place that people can review documents, provide their comments, and you can manage those in, in all in one place. 
again, it's it's an upgrade from the initial uh, rollout that we did in 20, 2013. Yeah, eNEPA was an ED3. EDC3. EDC3 innovation. It has since advanced um, since that was offered. Okay, I think uh, they talked about the funding opportunities in the beginning opening session here. So I'm not gonna cover these too much, but there is money available if you decide to go with you know, this innovation or the other ones. And uh, how are we gonna measure success? Again, the only way we measure success is how many of the states do request or, or assist technical assistance in either developing a um, from ground up sort of agreement, integration process, or go back and revisiting and tweaking what you already have in place. Again, I said scalable. If you only want to do this for CEs with documentations, you can do that, EAs or EISs, but it's scalable and, and the investment in you know, my mind is, is, is minimal with very little risk. And this slide is, is asking you, wh where are you with your integration process? There's a couple states here who might not be in, not implementing. You don't have one. We may have some here that are, have developed one, and now they're testing it, assessing, uh, demonstrating it, seeing what's, what's happening, and what kind of feedback we're getting from that. We're in the assessment mode. But I think a lot of states here are, is, well, you're institutionalized if you're using it. If you have one and you're not using it, you're not institutionalized. So I would say you're probably somewhere maybe in the development process at best if you're not utilizing it. If you're not utilizing it, ask yourself why. Because again, it's scalable. Maybe we don't have a lot of EISs going on, but I'm sure we have EAs which are going on. And I know since 90% of our program, if I'm correct, or categorical exclusions, and some of those require documentation. Very le least, know who your players are, know how to build relationships, and integration can sort of get you there. And identify, you know, talked and talked about key stakeholders. Don't forget about the tribal community, local governments, MPOs seem to be, you know, not well representative. Um, like I said before, we had some um, Coast Guard bridge projects get planning, get down the road, they almost get right to construction and uh, no one contacted the Coast Guard. So know who your stakeholders are because there's some we just may not think of. Again, some related. Um, you want to talk about some of these, David? Yeah, and Ken? Yes. Ken Petty, so our director of planning. Just want to point him out. Um, you know, we have uh, planning and environmental linkages. It, it allows you to bring in information uh, from the planning process into the NEPA process. So if you're in the planning process, you've done your public involvement, you kind of evaluated some alternatives and whatnot, it shows you what type of documentation you need to do to bring that into, into NEPA. Ecological is kind of like that conceptual framework from which, in, in my view, from which um, here's what the landscape looks like. Here's what our potential impacts are on a, on a landscape scale. Here's potential mitigation that we could offer or where mitigation might be located. And then you kind of, Pell kind of comes out of that. So once we identify what the project is, we can lay that on top of our GIS, start doing the documentation, bring that into NEPA um, and whatnot. And then finally, as you know, we're, we're getting into, in the FAST Act, um, there's a permitting dashboard. So Congress and the President are like, hey, we want to show you know, how long is it really taking to get your permits? How long is it taking to get these, these projects through? So that's, that's something that, that we'll be doing. I think the, the requirement for uh, the permitting dashboard is in June 1st, I believe. So those are some new uh, USDOT initiatives. And that, some are new and some are kind of been out there, but we're just kind of reemphasizing them. And this also sort of speaks to programmatic mitigation planning. We're looking at how does ecological, PEL, and pro pro programmatic mitigation planning, how does all that integrate you right. know, upon themselves? So again, if you look at that timeline that Mike had put up about legislation, we're going from looking at discrete resources to looking at how can we advance project delivery and build collaboration and make it transparent. 
so that you see this huge evolution. So we need, pro we need to do, get through the environmental process to get projects out there to help support the tr movement of goods and services and support the national economy, and we need to do that quickly. That's what the message that you see is being sent through the, the evolution of legislation and executive orders. And with a net benefit to, to the environment. So some of our next steps, this is summit number five. This is my fifth summit. Um, we're going to each state, promoting all these innovations, um, all these opportunities for um, the states to consider, maybe, some, maybe to actually implement some of those. And that's, that's all I got. So if we have questions, that's kind of abrupt ending, but it's kind of getting kind of warm in here, but. Uh, we need the microphone, sir. Yeah, we're recording. Yeah, oh, this is being recorded. I should have said that so before. So anybody wants to ask a question, raise your hands. Uh, the, the question is, what's the impact of the NEPA process on locally funded projects? On locally, what's the question? Uh, locally funded projects. I mean, what's, uh, how much of the NEPA process do they have to go through? They should be go if they're federally funded projects, they go through the whole NEPA process, whatever you know, class of action that would be, CE, EA, or EIS. You want state state funded only projects, that's separate. But I'll say this, if you, if you want to use an integration process for state funded projects, you certainly can because somebody, there's going to be, if you have an impact to a resource, most likely, let's say 404, Army Corps is going to be your lead federal agency. Uh, my, uh, my question was on locally, not non-federally yeah. funded. So is it like a regionally funded, sales tax funded projects? Mm -hmm. So th You could don't. still follow an integration, in my opinion, you could still follow an integration process, no matter where the money or funding is coming from. Okay. Okay. You, <coughs> you might still need a permit, okay. Yeah, because you're, you. you're going to need something from somebody most likely. And you would still, in California, you could probably talk to this, but you'd still need to meet your state if you have a state equivalent to NEPA. Uh, we had SEPA up when I was up in Washington State. I think California has uh, CEQA. CEQA, a lot of states, you know, New York has their own yeah. state process. A lot of states have their own state process. And some states choose to do NEPA just in case federal funding becomes available. Or they switch. Or they I've switch funding sources. Anybody else have a question or story to share? Is Hawaii is well represented? Are you guys were, were you aware you had a, a merger? I talked to somebody in Hawaii division, I can't remember yeah, who. I'm, I'm thinking, um, we, I, think, I, think we, oh. I think we called it up, um, just a general agreement with the regulatory agencies. Yeah. That's what I recall. I think it was from the 80s. Yeah, a lot of these things uh, go way back, so it, it's worth revisiting those to identify who the players are, you know, and if nothing else, David. So I, as a county engineer, I oversee not only roads, but we water and solid waste and buildings. So for Kahawai, we, we also have an agreement with the Army Corps and our Department of Health. They have an agreement that the Department of Health does the clean water site for okay. the Army Corps. So the 404 is merged into what we call a 104 for the Department of Health for the clean water site. And then we have fish and wildlife because we have endangered right. birds and koi. And then um, for just our own local money, we have our state, we call it a 343EA process. Mm -hmm. so that those agreements are working well for you? It works fine, yeah. Anything? And right now, for myself, we have, I don't, I, don't I don't know if it's written, but you know, we have a Tiger Grant. Yeah. We just got that, awarded that, and so, you know, from the governor and our, legis our congressional delegation down, we cannot fail, so our mayor is driving it. <laughs> so, yes. yeah. And, and with, with what I think's coming, you know, with the, the big buildup to improve our infrastructure and bridges, I think you're going to be seeing a lot more availability to sort of get some projects going that perhaps wouldn't have otherwise. So maybe integrating can sort of help, you know, navigate that. Dave or Cal, Caltrans, did you guys have anything you want to share with the group? Um, we, we, have, we have been, uh, we've been doing these 
You have an older agreement, right? How old's your? Sure. The, I'm sorry, the original, um, we call it NEPA 404 integration. Yeah. I think it's from the early 90s. Yes. And then it was re, it was um, implemented with, and some challenges noted uh, there in the 90s. And so it's, it, right now, it, I think it requires an EIS and five acres of wetlands impacts before it's triggered. Right. Because we were having so many challenges getting concurrence um, through the, you know, from purpose and need through on smaller projects. So it's really only implemented for larger projects. Um, and that, talking that's, to that's a good point. Um, when you write these agreements, you can have a trigger mechanism, therefore, you know, EISs only or EAs and EISs or five acres of wetland impact or 10,000, you know, linear feet of stream. So, but you can also make them fit to whatever you want. So that's a good point. The other thing that I wanted to mention is we have interagency agreements with pretty much all of our resource agencies, including the California resource agencies, so like Coastal Commission, the Water Board, we have them with EPA, and it really has streamlined our process. But we in California, as some of you may know, have the double sword of having CEQA too, which is much more restrictive than NEPA. So we have to work through that. So we've taken things that we've learned with NEPA and integrated them into the CEQA process too. Yeah. California also, um, I know you guys are after advanced mitigation. So um, I think that's becoming more and more a reality. We're, we're trying to work to see how we can actually do advanced mitigation because if you can do mitigation in advance, that's a big, big plus. That doesn't mean it's pre-decisional because I think that was one of the arguments well, if you already got approval for your mitigation, then your project's going to be permitted. Well, not, not so fast. So the point being, it's not, even though if you're doing your mitigation in advance, it's no guarantee you're, you're getting a, a permit. So we don't want to give the impression it's pre-decisional. When I worked in the Michigan division, I was the environmental program manager there, and we, the Wash Michigan State Department of Transportation brought in the resource agencies on an annual basis to talk about what worked well, what didn't work well, what's coming up, who's leaving? <laughs> you know, what are our key projects, priorities for the, for the next year, but not also, only for the next year, but for the next five years. So got that discussion, got it on their radar screens, and they were able to start that dialogue. And if people, you know, moved, they were kind of made aware of it as much, you know, as much mm -hmm. pre-notice as, as they could have and whatnot. But those are just some low hanging fruit techniques that they were using. For the DOT, we pretty much tell them what we have coming down the pipeline. We, we give them as much information as we know about our projects, and in return, they tell us about what they have coming down the pipeline. It works out really well. It uh, allows them to anticipate what we have happening, and then it, it lets us know that, oh, like you had mentioned, so-and-so is leaving, so now we have to start reaching out to different personnel. It's, I was, uh, I wasn't a big fan of it initially because it was a big issue on coordination, getting yeah. everybody involved. But it requires some effort. Yeah, but the uh, the byproducts are well worth it. Um, Nevada had an interesting project, um, Boulder City Bypass with a naturally occurring asbestos. Um, <laughs> so just when you think you haven't seen it all, I know California has some naturally occurring asbestos. I think you guys actually have. You, you have something in place, and I, I'm not sure if there's some information sharing between the California procedure and how Nevada got through uh, the, the Boulder City Bypass, but um, just think if we would have known about that up front and uh, we could have planned for that, because that, that got right up to construction, correct? And yeah, we, we had a couple of bid packages already out advertised, and uh, we had to cancel them. Well, yeah. temporarily delay them, and uh, we ended up putting together a, a program in a matter of a few months, yeah. and uh, it, was, it was very interesting. We, we actually, uh, Federal Highways and the Volpe Center actually helped with some seed money to sort of help get something in place to address, and what I hope comes out of that is the best management practices for other divisions, for other states to use, and, you know, if they do encounter 
uh, naturally occurring asbestos. So I, I'm a geologist, that's why that, that project did, did catch my eye. So know your geology of where your roads are going. So. Yeah, but Volpe was integral to helping yeah. us kind of establish some initial framework and then um, we had several consultants helping us yeah. out and each one of them had experts in the field. So when it all, when the dust all settled, mm -hmm. we ended up with what we called an expert panel. Right. And they, hel they helped us work through a lot of uh, sensitive issues. Right, so I mean, which agencies it was in charge of that? I believe it was EPA, because it's sort of an air quality thing. E well, and the governor was on top of us, you know, this yeah. is a big project, it's part of a future uh, interstate corridor, and so it was, uh, it, was, it was interesting. Right, so point being, if you had an integration process, maybe you know where, you know, perhaps if you, you know your geology, you know where to go. Who do I call if I have an asbestos issue, or how do I approach that from an integration process? Because so, that certainly held the project up, and I think it, things could have turned out differently if uh, you knew exactly what was going on. Who, who, who was to know? I think it was found out quite by accident um, through a... It's literally, it was the story of uh, someone riding a horse and ending up with asbestos fibers, I guess, that triggered it. Yes. I just wanted to make a comment about something that we do as part of our new assignment program. Every year, I have to make sure I don't talk too loud. Every year we um, send out a survey to our resource agency folks and it's done on SurveyMonkey. It goes through a consultant and then we get the results. And although we have been improving since we took over assignment in 2007, it's still not at the level that we want it to be at the, our, their satisfaction. And so what um, we started doing last year is reaching out to those agencies that had more of an unfavorable opinion, if you will, and working with them. And um, we're hoping this year to do more of that. And it was interesting because we just got the survey results back uh, that went out this summer, and it has increased over that. So, you know, if you have a consultant that can help you do Survey Monkey, keep it, you know, somewhat um, confidential, it, 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 it has helped us. Hey, Dave. I think you. Yeah. Do a lot of the same practices that I've heard, but ours was created in 2008, the 404 and Niebuhr merger between CDOT and the core and FHWA. We have a um, condition in there to update it every three years, so to revisit every three years so that folks, if there is turnover, they can get familiar with it. It helps because we have three core districts in our state, and a lot of times it's three different districts, you get three different interpretations. And the, uh, we've also have, uh, EPA and Fish and Wildlife as cooperating agencies, and so they have the opportunity to participate in that merger if they so choose. Could you talk a little bit about the workshop? We were talking about some of the, some of the services we provide. We did a workshop at uh, CDAC. Could you tell us? Sure, sure. It, wasn't, it was more focused on wildlife mobility, mm -hmm. um, something that uh, Colorado struggles with animal vehicle collisions and um, crossings through our network. And so uh, Mike and Dave's team uh, came out and helped us put together a, a two-day workshop where we brought in uh, sister agencies, um, uh, nonprofits, uh, academia, so we can um, kind of a community of practice, learn a little bit more about um, best practices that are happening uh, throughout the state, um, throughout the country, excuse me, and then kind of develop an action plan on how we can take some of these practices as a, a DOT and integrate that into our program. It was a very helpful uh, experience. So that's what we have to offer and uh, we're really hoping Hawaii requests technical assistance because I've <laughs> ne really never been to Hawaii. But uh, we certainly, uh, if you have any more questions, um, Dave and I are here. Um, we certainly, if you do request, we'll make sure something happens. And uh, Mike, wanna, point um, my information's up there. I have some business cards if you want it. But I certainly do appreciate um, everyone participating because it, it, it doesn't go well unless you guys participate. And this is this is one of the better groups. I certainly appreciate all the knowledge shared here. And there's a lot. So thanks again.